Welcome to another edition of Believe in Giants, along with Carl Banks. I'm Bob Papa. The Giants coming off a Sunday win at home against the Philadelphia Eagles. And just a reminder for everybody out there, bet online. We got a special offer for you, a welcome bonus, and I got a promo code for you as well that I'm going to share with you a little bit later on in the show, but it's worth 50%. So you get a 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Bet online, your number one spot for all basketball and football action this season. Carl, um, it wasn't pretty yesterday by any stretch of the imagination, but the Giants get their fourth win of the season. They beat the Eagles 13 to seven. Um, and they did it with defense. They got lucky at the end of the game, but for the balance of 60 minutes, they played very well defensively against the Eagles. Well, Bob, luck does factor into this when you look at the, um, I don't know if we call it karma or, or just the occurrence of events in these games. Normally it's something unexpected, right? So it was the last time the, the Giants played the Eagles on Monday night, it was Evan Ingram who uh, dropped one. And this week it was their wide receiver who dropped two. Uh, yeah. And, uh, but look, let's not let these little things get in the way of the fact that the Giants needed a win. They got it. Because I think we really do need to start off positive before we really dig into some very concerning trends, uh, which shouldn't shock anyone, but it is nevertheless still concerning. All right. So here's the positive point of things. You're watching this show right now. You're a Giants fan. You're a big fan of Carl. You want to hear what he has to say about the Giants. And yeah, Jalen Rager dropped two touchdown passes in the last minute of the game that would have beaten the Giants. But I would say this. You mentioned the Evan Ingram drop in Philadelphia that would have won the game last year at the two-minute warning. Game's over if he doesn't drop the ball. You think about the game a couple of years ago in Philadelphia where there's like a collision along the sideline with Janoris Jenkins. The Eagles complete a pass, and then Jake Elliott kicks a career-long 61-yard field goal. You think of Eli Manning in Philadelphia, the quarterback of the Eagles, and uh, quarterbacking against the Eagles uh, during this bad run against Philadelphia and having a drop pass at the end of the game on a post down the middle that would have won the Giants the game. So you know what? the football gods owed the Giants this one. <laughs> and well, I didn't even bring up Deshaun Jackson and Herman the Edwards and all that return. other stuff. Yeah. So, so the, yeah, go ahead. it ha go happens. Ahead. So they got they got the break this time. Okay, great. You they know played what? better they, than the Eagles. Right. They earned their break. And that's what happens, too. Um, they defensively uh, had a great game plan. Now, it wasn't um, – and Patrick Graham will tell you, like, the end of the half situation, um, they found their running game, and then they came back out in the second half and ran a little bit. But I think for the most part, where they needed to stand up, they did. And I thought, you know, we talked probably it was like week six when I said that they don't have alpha personalities on this defense, well, that has changed because you get a team on the one yard line and you give them four tries and you send them away, that takes an alpha personality. Um, I think they did as good a job defensively in terms of pride and not, not willing to concede anything uh, to their opponent. And that, in my opinion, and probably every player that I've ever played with is giant football. That's giant defense. You know, you're pissed off because they're down there. Doesn't mean they got to get anything out of the deal. And uh, they rose to the occasion and they were good on third downs. Um, so this defense did what it was supposed to do. Uh, they gave their team a chance and we taught complimentary football. Um, we'd have liked to seen the offense reciprocate a little more off of some of those uh, turnovers, but look, they scored enough points to win the game. And here's another positive too, Bob. 
when we get to the offense, and there's a lot to talk about, um, they didn't give up a sack. The only sack they got was a give up by Daniel Jones at the end of the game. Yeah, rather than throwing an incompletion, forcing Philadelphia to use the timeout at the end of the game. They didn't turn the ball over. That's another positive. So when you stink in some categories, like red zone offense, if you don't turn the ball over, you don't give up sacks, then you have you give yourself a chance, even in a bad football game, even in an ugly football game. Yeah, so, you know, you got to put this all in perspective. And I know Giants fans, and there were a lot of fans that were like uber critical even after the win. Um, and, I, and I get it. It's not perfect. Look, I, I don't think anybody who's a fan of the Giants from ownership on down thinks that this team is going to win a Super Bowl this year. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but going into this game, Jalen Hurts had a quarterback rating for the season of 90.4. He had 13 touchdowns and five interceptions. So the giant defense played well enough, disruptive enough to force Hurts to a third, a 14 of 31 game for 129 yards, three interceptions, finished the game with a quarterback rating of 17.5. And their rookie fifth-round draft pick out of Memphis, Kenneth Gainwell, was their leading receiver with three catches for 32 yards. So if you don't let Devontae Smith torch you, if you don't let Goddard eat you up, Goddard had one catch for zero yards. Okay. So the Giants defense did a lot. I mean, we could, you know, fans can talk about the two drop touchdown passes at the end of the game, but uh, you know, the balance of work here is they shut down their biggest weapons and they did it with Darnay Holmes getting hurt during the game after his interception and a Dory Jackson uh, on a sideline play injuring his quad trying to come back, but not able to come back and Logan Ryan, not playing. I mean, it is what it is, man. Those, those, they, they played win, winning defensive football. They did. And uh, going into the game, everybody thought, well, without Logan Ryan, this team just won't have a chance. And Jalen Hurts is playing very well. So that's that. Okay. Um, celebrate the W. Now I really kind of need to get into the, the nitty gritty of what, has to happen for this football team and what's apparent. So the offensive coordinator changed, the offensive play caller changed in the stark reality, that pot of cold water over your head, that water balloon that smacks you in the face happened to Freddie kitchen, which he did. He already knew. They ain't much changed because he's working with the same personnel. And yes, um, what he did was different than um, what Jason Garrett did personnel-wise, but it's it, you're not overhauling, number one, you're not overhauling the entire system week 10 of the season. Number two, your personnel is what it is, but you can redecorate the furniture. You got the same six chairs, and you only choose to sit in four, then now you're going to choose another two, meaning Galladay and uh, Evan Ingram. Two players that, you know, two positions, one player in one position that was just not used enough in the previous regime, right? So Galladay got more involved. Evan Ingram yeah, Gall- had some Galladay really had plays. seven targets and Ingram was targeted six times. Right. So what... what Freddie looked at the room and said, you know what? I like this chair a lot better in the red zone. I like this chair a lot better on third down. So I'm going to keep these guys in the room. I'm going to take these other guys out. So that was that. But then you've got an offensive line that um, is – uh, bad, 
Yeah, I mean, it's bad is a bad word. They are just they're they are not. Let's just say this: they're not productive in areas. And again, I am not. I'm not going to sugarcoat this, but I'm not going to be malicious about this. But when you are in the bottom three, categorically across the board. There's nothing you can say other than they need to get better. Every category offensively. Am I right on this? Yeah. If you go back to the start of the 2020 season, uh, the Giants are dead last in red zone. They're like 31st in points per game. They're 31st in yards per game. They're 28th in passing yards per game. Their last in touchdowns scored in the National Football League of all 32 teams. Now, that's bad. That That's like, that's not good. And the problem that I think everybody has with the fact that it's not bad, I mean that it's that bad, is that you have, you have had over the course of this season and last season, you've had games where you've had your relatively full complement of players and they still can't score. Like I, I go back to the Atlanta game in which they lost to the Falcons earlier this year. They had everybody available in that game. Yeah. And they couldn't score against the Falcons. So it, to me, it all circles back to the one thing that was supposed to get fixed. Um, and it hasn't been fixed is the offensive line. Now, yeah. you know, I know Gates got hurt and I know Lemieux got hurt, but it's not as if those guys were proven pro bowl quantities. They were, they were constants, uh, especially Nick Gates. I think he gave this offense a, a, a profile, but the, the other thing too, and, and, you know, in terms of production, I thought the offense looked its best. The only game of the year against Washington. I think they, they, they looked good. They blocked well. Uh, they were able to do a lot of different things. And, and New Orleans, you know, too. New Orleans, yes. But it was one of these deals where what worked there that's not working every other week? Because if something's working against those two defenses, boy, that's got to give some offensive co- – I mean, defensive coordinators some, some concern because, hey, they're blocking up some pretty good players. But here's the thing. It's the inconsistency of – this offensive line, there is, and it's perplexing, and I'm going to put it out there, Matt Pert is, it's time. It's time. To, you have to flip the switch. I can't imagine, though I am not in any coaches meeting, I can't imagine they don't want him to play. And here's why. And I made this analogy to – um Nate Solder, right? I made this analogy about him. I say he's a car with bad brakes, and that has nothing to do with him personally. It's, it's where he is in his career. If you got a car with bad brakes, you got to have all the conditions right. And with Nate Solder, if he's got to play 70, 75 plays, he's going to give you everything he got for 75 plays. But five of those plays – are probably going to, he's going to have some bad, about five bad plays out of 75, and they're going to come at the worst time, right? You got a guy you drafted in the third round. They have, again, I have not talked to the coach, but I can look with an educated eye and see that these offensive line rotations were meant to get some of these young players acclimated to the game so that they could press a guy like Nate Solder for his job. And at this stage of Nate's career, he'd be happy to be a backup, but he's going to give you everything he has, no matter where he's playing and and, and how long he has to play. It's just not at some point, your car is going to be on the hill and the brakes ain't going to be able to hold up. And that's what happens with, with Nate Soda. This just, it's what it is. And the fact that you got a third round player, that has not flipped the switch to the level that gives this coaching staff confidence that they can trust him out there and they will re- they would rather have Nate on the field. Again, no disrespect for Nate because he, he battles, 
He has a bad play. He comes back in battles. It's not going to be a bad day for him, but he does have bad plays. If you can't press him, it's time. It's that you cannot you cannot get into a mentality. And I don't know Matt Perk personally, so I couldn't tell you if he's a scholarship minded player, meaning you know okay being the backup in every year. Okay being the backup. Um, we had guys like that that were on the Giants roster, like a James Brewster, a James Brewer, and a Bobby Hart where they were always the backup and every time their their every every year their time came they were okay being the backup they would put another guy in front of me oh you can go in front of me i i'm good right that cannot be the mentality this offensive line is too important uh as with every team but in particular with this team the 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 talent that they have at skill position at running back and the consistency of the quarterback relies on this talent, uh, on this offensive line. So they've got to get certain players to step up, period. Oh, I, it's, go ahead. What do you think it is? I mean, <clears throat> Joe Judge, as the head coach of the Giants, was 6-10 and 10 last year. <clears throat> they had three wins going into yesterday's game. They got their fourth win of the season. They've had to fire the offensive coordinator. They've changed over players in the roster and everything. What do you think? What do you think the reason is without anybody telling us? I mean, just from an educated guess, I, I don't think that they're uh, beholden to Nate Solder for any reason. Right. The, they love him because he gives you better effort than the guy younger than him. That's why. Um, and, and look, with coaches, they'll all tell you it, it comes down to trust. It comes down to trust. Can they trust that the young guy is going to get the snap count? Are they going to trust that the young guy is going to get his assignment? Like Nate knows his assignment. Sometimes he just can't do it, right? Uh, the young guy should be able to do it and know it. So I think it really comes down to trust. And that's a player issue more so than a coaching decision. That your your level to instill trust in this this coaching staff is a direct function of your play time. If they can if they can trust you, you're gonna play, and you need to do that. You need to be that guy. Again, I don't know him to say that he has bad habits. I don't know him to say that he's not grasping things. All I know is that the other guy's in front of him. He's got him by about eight or 10 years. Uh, when they put you out there, it's inconsistent at best, and that needs to change. That switch has to flip because you, and maybe it's a matter of him playing more, and I'm not picking on it. I'm just stating the fact. Like, your offensive line needs you. Well, there was a stark difference in person. Watching the game yesterday as we're calling the game. And, you know, the Eagles would run a quick hitting run play. And it was like, poof. it was, hey, maybe they would get three or four, but you saw the potential there for that three or four to maybe go for 15 or 20. Mm -hmm. Like holes are just opening up fast. Hurts hand on the ball and poof, guy's gone. And then you watch the Giants, and it's like <clears throat> there, there's very little push at the point of attack. Nobody's really getting blown off their feet, and the backs have to make a lot of moves or a lot of things in order to make a play positive. Nothing looks easy. Uh, nope. You know, Barkley had the 32-yard run on his 12 other carries. His 12 other carries netted eight yards. You can't have that. You, you just cannot have that. And, you know, offensive linemen have to have a mentality, right? And look, it doesn't matter that you went to a small school. You were evaluated as a third round talent. In the NFL, an offensive lineman who's drafted in the first three rounds, you're expected to be a starter. 
at some point. You're not a you're not a flyer. They take flyers in the fifth round on offensive linemen. If you're drafting the third round, that means you've got the measurables um, and whatever else they felt it took to be selected that high. You got to compete for a job and you got to at some point win that job. Um, it's just that simple. Uh, I don't know the answer to it other than you got to get going and you got to prove to people especially those in that, that, that meeting room that make decisions, you've got to tell them through your play, through your habits, through your mentality that I'm ready to be a full-time player. I'm not going to go out on the, the field and make mistakes and give up uh, sacks and procedural penalties. I got to be that guy because, you know, everybody, you know, as of six weeks ago, Oh, Andrew Thomas is a bust because somebody got on TV and said he was the worst lineman of the guy, the guys drafted, right? Well, obviously you ain't heard that anymore. Cause you know what? He's he's committed himself, but he was a, he was a first round draft choice, but he's committed himself and he's doing a hell of a job. He's doing a hell of a job. And he's a guy you look at and say, okay, this is one that we were counting on. Pert was another one that they were counting on. You gotta get on the field, bro. Say goodbye to dull gifts. Lightbox lab-grown diamonds are the brightest gift of the year. Use cutting-edge technology, innovative techniques. They've cracked the science of sparkle, creating the highest lab-grown diamonds that you can find at a light price, Carl. 800 per carat. They have the same chemical makeup of natural diamonds, but they're grown in a lab. Because of this process, they can create stones in blush pink, beautiful blue, as well as classic white. Lightbox lab-grown diamonds are the gift they'll never want to take off. Price so they won't have to. They really do make an outfit sparkle. So you want to know more about this? Lightbox diamonds, man. Check it out. They've got uh, some cool, innovative things. The holidays are coming. So go to lightboxjewelry.com and add a little sparkle to your holiday shop. I know you're very tied up with Christmas time coming, Carl. You got to find the gifts. You got a lot of gifts to get. Yeah. Light box jewelry could be a way to go for you. All right. It's like a little sparkle, man. Everybody no likes a little sparkle. All right. So I want to go to uh I want to go to another. Well, I mean, uh, the thing that pissed me off the most yesterday was when the Giants went on that drive in the fourth quarter and and Skura got called for a false start on a third and two which just led to a third and seven and it led to a field goal when a touchdown would have ended the game. Um, but that's been the story of the giant season. Another great story to this season is Xavier McKinney mm. because uh, you know, he played that center field just like you would draw it up and getting the interception. And he nearly had a game ceiling interception I don't begrudge him for not catching it. There was uh, some contact or whatever, but his break on the ball, his anticipation, his understanding of what was happening in front of him. It's awesome to watch this kid grow. No, it really is the development of that. This class of, of players has been good. Um, and again, that's, again, I, I, you know, I, I tend to harp on things a little bit, but that's all the more reason why, a guy like Matt Pert should look around at the guys that that came in in those two drafts and say, you know what, I need to get on the stick here. I could have a really nice, really nice thing going. But Xavier McKinney is, and we talked about this when they were in Cleveland, and I made the comment to you that he just, he moves like a football player. He moves like he belongs on the field. And when I say that, is that there was nothing robotic about him. It was no second guessing. It wasn't doing something, looking over at the coaches <coughs> and looking at the coaches and saying, did I do it right? Like he just has instinctive things that just says he was built for the pro game. Like understanding patterns, understanding reads when you, 
he takes you through his interceptions. He tells you, I made sure I had to make sure I get the right depth. Number two did this. So I knew I had my eyes had to be the number one. And then back to the quarterback. Just real pro football uh talk in 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 movements. He he belongs, he plays like he belongs out there. He doesn't play like a young player. Um and I think that has been such a big asset to this team and for years to come. And then we talk about, you know, there's so much made of draft picks who picked them and what have they done for me lately? The thing is, personnel people miss on more than they hit. But when they have the hits, you want those hits to look like Andrew Thomas and you want those hits to look like uh, Xavier McKinney. That's what hits look like when you hit a draft choice and hopefully when healthy Kadarius Tony, cause you can see there too. So when you have uh, those type of hits and it's, you can look at it with the naked eye and say, he's a player. We got us a good one there. That's when, you know, somebody did something right in the evaluation process. Right. And it's also a testament to the player as well. Cause keep in mind, um, McKinney came here and he was injured. I mean, he, he had a foot issue. I believe that that yeah. kept him out the majority of his rookie year. Now he got what, four games under his belt, five yeah, games a couple under at his the belt. end of the year. But think about this. When I say it's a testament to him, when they put him out there, he was making plays. It wasn't like he had to ramp up. He was doing all the work. And the coaches spoke about this too. During his rehab, he was doing all the work mentally, making sure he understood everything that was going on. So when he got on the field, there was not a big ramp up period for him. Right. I'll tell you why, Carl. Um, very encouraged about him. I like the way Julian Love has stepped up for the Giants. Oh, I get, can we talk about that? Yeah, this is our podcast. We can talk about whatever we but, want. Uh, we we really have to talk about Julian Love. Um, I was having a conversation with some folks that we work with um, when we were in Tampa. We had dinner, and we're just sitting out. Weather was nice. And they asked, what do you think of Julian Love? And I said... Listen, here's what you get with Julian Love. You get a kid who's going to be where he's supposed to be. He's not going to make mistakes. Uh, and he's going to do it from a multitude of positions, including special teams. Um, as smart and it's as heads up a player as you'll ever get with ability. Now, if he has to step in and play number one corner because he's played corner, in college, it's going to be mixed results, right? Um, but can he play slot corner? Can he play nickel back? Can he play linebacker? Absolutely. But whatever position you put him in, it's really going to come down to if the other guy is just better than him. Because he's not going to have too many failures in technique. Um, he's going to be where he's going to be. He's going to make great decisions. You saw him in coverage. You saw him in blitzing um, yesterday. And I, I you know, it's in, pun intended, I love him because he is a guy that you can love. When he plays, you know, he, he makes your team better. He's a good, a, a good culture guy in terms of winning and dependability and everything a coach would want other players to look at. Okay, he prepares well. He shows up prepared on game day. He works hard. He doesn't make the same mistake twice. That's the culture that Joe Judge is building. These are the type of players within your culture that are going to keep your locker room in a, a positive uh, mindset. And when this thing turns, those will be the guys you look at. Him. Uh, McKinney, guys that uh, uh, um, 
Ojolari, guys that show up, young guys that show up, Andrew Thomas, young guys that show up, uh, Daniel Jones, obviously he's your, he's your leader. But as this thing turns, these are the key pieces that are going to make the biggest difference in the culture of your organization in terms of its uh, sustainability. You know, we're not doing this live. I would love to see a wave of hands. I mean, the Giants between injury, roster turnover, when you're having a bad season, you're you're looking for new pieces. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had guys running around on the field yesterday in crunch time. All right, Aaron Robinson was a draft pick. He was a third-round pick, but he he didn't do anything in camp or anything because he was injured. So he just he came off pop. He's been active for a couple of games. But then you're like, J.R. Reed. Who is J.R. Reed? <laughs> he played significant plays down the yeah. stretch. The second-year guy out of Georgia who spent last year with the Rams. He's an undrafted player. And then who's Stephen Parker? 38. Uh, he's a third-year guy out of Oklahoma, signed as a free agent. He's been with the Cowboys in Miami. And, like, hey, who's 49? Who's – like, it's uh, – who 95? Yeah. Well, Roche made – you know, he made he made big play at the end of the Raiders game. But it really is amazing how many guys they're cycling through here. Yeah, and look, they're showing up, and they actually are playing like they belong on the field. Again, sometimes it's ability, but like they are getting these guys prepared. Uh, when you look at the amount of people that had to play in the Giants defense on Sunday, and they weren't, it wasn't all simplistic stuff either. Like guys had to know what they were doing. They were doing some interchangeable things and they did a good job. Um, and even, you know, on the offensive side of the football, you got tight end who's factored in two big catches in the game, one for a touchdown. And he was, what, off the practice squad? Yeah, I mean, Chris Myrick, he was with the Dolphins last year, signed to the practice squad, you know, in September, signed off the practice squad elevation guy with Caden Smith and Rudolph inactive. On a short week. You got to get ready, kid. Got a touchdown. Yeah. How, unli so, how unlikely is it that the last two touchdowns, the offense has only scored two touchdowns in the last two weeks. And Andrew Thomas and Chris Myrick have the two touchdowns. The you unusual find, suspects. There is no way, even at the great bet online, could they have had a prop bet like that? Could not. There's no way. Could not. Um, yeah, so listen, it's a win. It's a it's it's a much needed win. Uh, it was one of those victories that your coaching staff can say you can win tough games. Uh, not only was it the um, the rivalry of it, but just the fact that these are games that losing teams normally lose. They find a way to lose. You have four turnovers in the game you have zero and it's still life or death life or death and somehow you figured it out and that's that's important because that helps going into the following week against Miami um Miami's going to give them offensively they give you a lot of window dressing right they can expect a little bit of what Philadelphia gave them and a lot of other stuff you know, it's just a lot of different looks that Miami uh, gives you. And then that's a call uh, the teaser for our podcast right. later in the week. That's right. And they, you know, they pressure like nobody's business. But uh, as for this victory Monday, uh, you take it um, offensively. I think we will probably see a little more of the redecoration process of Freddie Kitchens and staff. Um, furniture's getting moved around, but it ain't changing, you know, because ain't no new, put it this way, there's nothing new out in the market right now this time of year anyway. So mm -hmm. this is what you got. Um, A lot of I, scratch I am, and dent. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
I'm hoping, I'm imploring Matt Pert to do whatever is necessary to give these coaches confidence that he can play. It's time. Um, there's, you know, the last scholarship left the roster with Sam Bill. Everybody else has, has got to be counting on to contribute. So, um, you know, don't be a scholarship guy. I don't think they're going to allow it anyway, but you got to step up. You know, it's a call to action. Uh, speaking of that, uh, I promised the promo code uh, because Bet Online is back and better than ever, and it's your number one spot for all basketball and football action this season. If you go to the new updated desktop or mobile website and sign up today, you receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Here's the promo code. Believe B L E A V 50. And you're going to receive your bonus of 50%, a welcome bonus. Basketball, football, hockey, boxing, UFC, your favorite Vegas casino games, right there for Bet Online, where the game starts. Believe 50. All right. So I have a, a, just a couple of little things here. Uh, <clears throat> don't take the cheese if you're a Giants fan. They won the game. That's great. But just a, you got to, as a fan, you got to just say, okay, now let's see what we do if they can back this up next week and win a second game. Because I got to be honest with you, I'm watching Sunday Night Football last night with Max. And they're doing the playoff picture in the AFC with the Ravens and the Browns and the Patriots potentially could be the number one seed and all that other stuff. Then they flip over to the NFC picture. So they got the teams that are leading the division. They've got the uh, they've got the three teams that are leading in the wild card race, and then in the hunt. And I had to I, I I had missed it, like I wasn't watching intently. And all of a sudden, Max said to me, "Dad, look, there's the Giants," and I'm like, so I had to hit rewind. And in the in the hunt, the Giants are now in the hunt by virtue of that win. They met, they for the first time, and I don't know. For the first time since last year, the Giants logo was up there as far as the teams in the NFC in the hunt. So that was exciting for a, a, a kid who's not even seven yet. Yeah. But I want to just I just yeah. want to I just want to energize the fan base to say. You want to be in the hunt? Go to Miami and win next week. Get yeah. a fifth win. Like, let's yeah. not start. It, oh, we could win this one. Good. The Giants are a week-to-week -week proposition. But it yeah. floored me to see the Giant logo in the hunt for the playoffs. Well, just tell you, like, you can, you know, just continue to do your work. Um, I, I Like I said, the Giants, their big picture is the one in front of them this week. They're, they're not afforded any of that. And, you know, climb to 500, climb over 500, let's talk. But you're not going to do that if you continue to to win games being categorically the bottom three across every offensive category. That has to change. And look, it may not change uh, appreciably in these last six, seven games. I mean, the 26th or 23rd. But if you can category. climb, listen. I don't know what the average scoring is in the NFL, but if you can get to a point to where you can score 20 points a game, I think that's the average, right? 18, 20 points a game. Yeah. I don't have the numbers in front. If of you me, can but... score 20, then I'm sure they can figure out how to get another 10 points with this kicker. Right. Um, so just aspire to be seven points better, get to the league average because once, if you can get to the league average, I think the court pops and there's a whole new flow of thinking that says, okay, now I can do this, now I can do that. But that only comes, Bob, when that offensive line can play better. Yeah, and I mean, listen, if you, really take, comes down to. if you take out the Xavier McKinney pick six and the Leonard Williams safety, so that's 16 points. Take the 16 points off the Giants point total for this year. You know, going into yesterday, offensively, they're averaging 16 points a game. 
Like you can't win in the NFL scoring yeah. 16 points. And the thing is, and we said this on the post game show yesterday, if you had a draft and you took team, there are a bunch of teams out there that have winning records. And if you had a draft and you said, uh, they're starting running back or Saquon Barkley, most people would pick Saquon Barkley. They're starting wide receivers, their group, as opposed to Galladay, Shepard, Tony, and Slate. They're tight ends. And Ross. And John Ross. They're tight ends. Ingram, Rudolph. Okay. Like the Giants would there's there's a there's a lot of wins there. Like you would yeah, you would take the giant players. So it shouldn't be that bad. But you know, I we're beating a dead well, horse. Well, this. but here's the thing. You wanna you wanna know the difference between 16 and 20 points or 17 and and 21 points? Yeah, red zone. No, no, I'll give it to you. The difference is yes, it's red zone, but it's an offsides penalty at the 25 yard line that all of a sudden pushes you back. It's a delay of game penalty on top of that before they even snap the ball that pushes you back even further. Now you're looking at a third and 15 or third and 20 from the 35 yard line. Right. That's After the, the McKinney interception. Oh my God. You're first yeah. and 10 at your own 46. And next thing you know, you're in third and like third Forever. and 90 Jennings to punt. Yeah, so that's the difference. Like, if you can move the ball down the field and you get in the red zone, don't have an offsides penalty, right? Don't have a delay of game on top of that, right? Give yourself a chance. If you're first and 10 from the 20 or you're you're second and eight from the 18-yard the line, Hell, you should be thinking end zone more so than, well, let's kick a field goal. We just we just penalized ourselves out of this, okay. right? That's when that's when the focus should be heightened when you get there, and it's a difference between three and seven points or seven and a punt because you penalize yourself out of even a field goal. Hey, can I? Um, you got anything else to get off your chest? That's it, man. That's it. I got to give a big round of applause to our buddy. We've talked about this on the show before, uh, the High Lawn in New Jersey. The amazing Sam Hazen. Yeah, amazing Sam Hazen. I saw because, the pictures. <clears throat> well, I mean, it's got the best. It arguably has one of the best views in all of New Jersey. I mean. What's a view without great food, right? Yeah. It's just a, a view. It's just, it's a, just view. a view. But we went in and they gave us uh, – he gave myself, Kathleen, Max, Kathleen's son, Michael, a full tour of the kitchen down into the basement where they make the desserts and, and all the machinery. But the food matched all the equipment and his staff. If you live in the New Jersey area and you want to do something special and you want to see this spectacular view of New York City. While eating a spectacular meal. I mean, everything was on point. Like there was nothing. I saw Max with a tomahawk. Max went tomahawk. I Max went. That. Max had a tomahawk. Well, I mean, we shared it, but. Well, let me just tell you something. Like the, the most bone. impressive part of it was Max was so dapper. Oh. He had the blazer, the sweater, the scarf. He had the whole thing going. Oh, he had the nice white, perfectly white going out sneakers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so, all on that's all on mom. She knows. I mean, she's got a great eye for clothes and she knows how to dress him up and he loves to get dressed up. Max looked great. He was bespoke because when I told him uh, when we went out Saturday night, I said to him, you don't have to wear your jacket tonight. And he was like, no, nah, wear my jacket, wear my yeah. jacket. He's got he the little hooded too. sweatshirt. Yeah, so he great. Uh, check out the amazing Sam Hazen. Who high lawn. Uh, high lawn, the high lawn, check it out on Instagram, the high lawn. If you live in the New York, New Jersey area, it is well, or worth if you it. don't make it a point, if you're to coming come, into town, if you're coming into town, you've got to make that a uh, destination because the food alone is worth it. Great staff too. cool bar scene. Everything's great. Yep. Everything was great. All right. That's uh, we're. Hey, listen. Oh, one more thing. 
And then we got to wrap it up. So you and I are on the field as we always do before the game yesterday. And, uh, mm. you know, we come out of one tunnel. We walk through the back of the end zone, past the tunnel where the Giants come out, over to the Giant bench to do our on the field report. How many fans were chanting, tell a friend, tell a friend, to tell, tell a friend, friend. To tell a friend. That's right. Catch we appreciate on. you guys. Yes. So all of you, I don't know all of your names. Next next home game, I'm going to videotape the fans yelling, tell a friend. And it will tell post Tell a friend to video. tell a friend. Papa we'll Banks Pie. We'll have Alex post a video. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Name of the program. We'll be back later in the week for a preview of the Dolphins. Believe in Giants with Carl Banks and Bob Papa. Enjoy your week, everybody.